Prophecy number one, the change of society. 2 Timothy 3, 1, 5. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. In the times in which we live, we are witnessing an unprecedented moral and ethical decline, a significant sign that the prophecies spoken of in the scriptures are not just ancient words, but living, breathing truths unfolding before our very eyes. The passage from 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 to 5, serves as a mirror reflecting the current state of our society, where the behaviors and attitudes so vividly described by Paul seem to leap from the pages of the Bible and manifest in our daily lives. As we delve into this passage, it becomes apparent that we are living in times marked by a profound self-centeredness. It's a theme that resonates deeply with our generation where the elevation of self above all else has become the norm. This self-love, which the scripture warns us about, is not about a healthy sense of self-respect, but a deep-seated narcissism that places individual desires above the welfare of others. Our society encourages us to love ourselves unconditionally, promoting the idea that such self-love is the foundation of a healthy personality. However, this has led to a culture of narcissism where excessive self-absorption and self-admiration prevail, often at the expense of empathy and compassion for others. In this environment, the needs and well-being of family and community are frequently overshadowed by a pursuit of personal pleasure and gain. We are living in an age where people think the whole world revolves around them, where the attitude of me, myself, and I alone matters. Fall out of love with yourself. Fall out of love with your sin. And fall out of love with your lust. Fall in love with your family. Fall in love with your kids and your loved ones, and put them first. This selfishness manifests in various ways, as described in 2 Timothy. Individuals become lovers of themselves to the detriment of their relationships and communities. The characteristics listed by Paul, being traitors, headstrong, haughty, and lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, stem from a singular root, an overwhelming focus on the self. Betrayal arises when personal gain is valued over loyalty and trust. Being headstrong and haughty reflects an arrogance and stubbornness that disregards the wisdom and needs of others. And the preference for pleasure over devotion to God highlights a profound misalignment of priorities where transient joys are pursued at the expense of eternal life. We are living in an age where the transient joys of lustful pleasure are elevated above communion with God Men and women prioritize pleasure over their devotion to God. Sin and lust carry with them fleeting pleasures. People don't sin because it brings them pain. Rather, they sin because there's a temporary delight in wrongdoing. Sin can transport you to a place filled with metaphorical sunshine and roses, yet only for a moment. This fixation on the here and now, on the material rather than the spiritual, leads many to choose the fleeting pleasures of sin over the promise of eternal life with God. I have encountered individuals who acknowledge the reality of God and the necessity of salvation. Nonetheless, their love for sin and its immediate gratifications causes them to turn away from God, pursuing a life of sinful pleasures instead. The relentless pursuit of personal gain, often at the expense of others, mirrors the prophetic warnings of a society losing sight of its moral compass where the relentless hunger for more becomes a never-ending cycle of emptiness, a society that calls good evil and evil good. We live in a society that accepts, celebrates, and even promotes things that were once considered evil and are still considered sin in the eyes of the Lord. Moreover, the prophecy speaks to a culture of boastfulness and pride where individuals tout their achievements and status with little regard for humility or grace. This prevailing attitude not only distances individuals from each other, but also from God, creating a society that values accolades over acts of kindness and compassion. 
In this environment, the true essence of community, support, understanding, and mutual respect becomes obscured by the shadows of arrogance and self-importance. The scripture's mention of people being lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God rings eerily true in today's world, where the pursuit of momentary delights and sensory pleasures often takes precedence over spiritual discipline and devotion. Prophecy number two, the beginning of sorrows. We are living in the beginning of sorrows, a time foretold with prophetic clarity and sobering detail. This phrase, the beginning of sorrows, speaks to a period marked by a series of events, each increasing in frequency and intensity, heralding the unfolding of a divine narrative set before time itself. These sorrows are not mere natural phenomena or random occurrences. They are the birth pangs of a creation groaning for redemption, the precursors to the culmination of history as we know it. The beginning of sorrows signifies a critical juncture in the divine timeline, a period characterized by turmoil, upheaval and distress. This era is marked by wars and rumors of wars, nations rising against nations, kingdoms against kingdoms, famines, pestilences and earthquakes in various places. Let us focus on earthquakes for a moment. The phenomenon of earthquakes increasing in frequency and intensity serves as a compelling illustration of the beginning of sorrows prophecy, manifesting tangibly across our planet. From the dawn of the 20th century to the year 2000, seismological data has shown a marked rise in both the number and the severity of earthquakes globally. This trend is not merely anecdotal, but is supported by comprehensive data collected and analyzed by geological and seismological institutes worldwide. For instance, records indicate that the frequency of significant earthquakes, those with a magnitude of 6.0 or greater, has seen a noticeable increase throughout the 20th century. The early 1900s recorded fewer than 100 significant earthquakes per decade, a number that has steadily risen, culminating in several hundreds of such events annually by the century's end. They mark the onset of a period of unparalleled significance, a time when the world is being prepared for the return of Christ. These sorrows remind us that we are living in an age of both profound challenge and unparalleled opportunity. They are a call to vigilance, to prayer, and to a deepening commitment to live out our faith with urgency and compassion. As we observe the world around us, it is evident that the frequency and intensity of these sorrows are indeed increasing. Wars and conflicts rage with alarming regularity, leaving trails of devastation and despair. Famines and pestilences, too, strike with relentless force, claiming lives and shattering communities. And amidst these, the earth itself groans with earthquakes and natural disasters, as if crying out for redemption. These events, troubling as they may be, are not without purpose. They serve as wake-up calls, divine alerts that beckon us to look beyond the temporal and set our sights on the eternal. They remind us that this world, with all its beauty and brokenness, is not our final home. We are reminded that, as followers of Christ, our hope is not anchored in the shifting sands of this world, but in the unchanging promises of God. And finally, they remind us that Jesus is coming soon. Prophecy number three, knowledge shall increase. Daniel 12, 4, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. There are different explanations provided by Bible commentaries regarding Daniel 12, 4, and each holds validity, presenting extremely compelling points. The first interpretation suggests that the phrase, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase, refers to the rapid advancements in transportation and technological progress. In contrast, the second posits that it indicates many will delve into the scriptures in their quest for knowledge, with the majority of Bible scholars aligning with this interpretation. Both interpretations have elements manifesting in today's world. 
observable through the increase in frequency and intensity of these phenomena. The first suggests a general explosion of knowledge, arguing that the phrase refers to the worldwide travel in the end times with cars, buses, trains, rockets, and airplanes alongside the increase of physical knowledge. Daniel's prophecy that knowledge shall be increased has been fulfilled in numerous ways. We are living in an era of easily accessible information, with more knowledge at our fingertips than ever before, a time of unparalleled knowledge and technological advancement. Over the last 3,000 years, significant changes have occurred in how we live, work, and communicate, from the invention of stone tools around 100,000 BC to the development of biotech, nanotech, and quantum computing in the 21st century. These innovations highlight the exponential growth of knowledge, with each decade seeming to accelerate the pace of innovation. As we delve deeper into the first interpretation of Daniel 12, 4, we marvel at the vast expanse of human achievement and the burgeoning horizons of understanding. The technological marvels we engage with daily would astonish the ancient world. The pace of knowledge acquisition and innovation has not been merely linear, it has been exponential. With each passing century, our advances have not just added to our capabilities, they have multiplied them. The most significant shift arguably began with the Industrial Revolution, as machines started to replace manual labor and industry began to boom, marking the start of knowledge's uphill trajectory. A perfect illustration of this is SpaceX. SpaceX, a private aerospace manufacturer and space transport services company founded in 2002 by Elon Musk, exemplifies the astonishing leap in human knowledge and capabilities. Just two centuries ago, horseback was the most common mode of transport. Yet today, private companies are not merely reaching for the stars. They are planning to colonize other planets. SpaceX's journey is a testament to the rapid advancement of technology and human intellect. Within just two decades, SpaceX has revolutionized space travel, developing reusable rockets like the Falcon 9, which drastically reduce the cost of accessing space. Its development of the Dragon spacecraft has been instrumental in resupplying the International Space Station, ISS, marking significant strides in cargo and crewed space missions. The Starship, currently under development, is poised to take humans to Mars, turning what once was a sci-fi dream into a near-future reality. What is most remarkable about SpaceX is its pioneering role in the private space industry. This shift from government-led space programs to private ventures signifies a significant change in human enterprise and knowledge, reflecting our growing understanding of technology and our potential in the universe. The existence of companies like SpaceX challenges our conceptions of what is possible. Several decades ago, the notion of a private company not just participating in, but leading space exploration and even planning Mars colonization would have been inconceivable. Yet here we are, witnessing private innovation driving us towards a future that once existed only in the realms of imagination. This leap in knowledge and capability within such a short span of time is nothing short of miraculous, aligning perfectly with the prophecy of Daniel that knowledge shall be increased. We are living in an age where the boundaries of human achievement are continually being pushed further, with the rapid pace of technological advancement in our time clearly fulfilling the prophetic words spoken thousands of years ago. SpaceX is just one example among many of our era's extraordinary advancements. From space exploration to the intricacies of quantum physics, the increase in knowledge is evident everywhere. It's not just about the accumulation of facts, but about an expanding understanding of the universe and our place within it. This incredible surge in knowledge and capability brings to mind the prophetic nature of the book of Daniel. Daniel, living in a time when such advancements were unimaginable, prophesied a time when knowledge would increase and people would traverse great distances, a prophecy strikingly aligned with our current reality. In reflecting on SpaceX and our broader technological advancement, we are reminded of the timeless truth of Scripture and the unfolding of God's sovereign plan through history. As we marvel at the achievements of our age, let us remember the source of all wisdom and knowledge and the prophetic words that foretold these remarkable times. 
The second interpretation of Daniel 12.4 offers an insightful perspective on spiritual growth, suggesting humanity's quest goes beyond mere physical achievements or the acquisition of worldly knowledge. Instead, it emphasizes a deep dive into spiritual enlightenment, where individuals, particularly in these latter days, immerse themselves in scriptures, seeking a profound understanding and experiencing a remarkable increase in spiritual knowledge. Esteemed theologians and biblical scholars argue that the phrase, many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased, is less about the speed of modern transportation or the advance of secular education and more about a journey of discovery within God's word. This viewpoint posits that as we draw closer to the end times, there will be a significant uptick in the number of God's people delving into prophetic scriptures, seeking guidance, clarity, and insight as they dive deep into the divine teachings. This interpretation holds tangible truth in our times. We are witnessing an unprecedented depth of understanding and appreciation for biblical prophecy, unmatched in any prior era. The reservoir of knowledge available to our generation regarding the scriptures is unparalleled. Interestingly, the technological advancements often cited in the first interpretation also play a crucial role in facilitating this spiritual awakening. Technology has significantly enhanced our capability to study and understand the scriptures. With the digital revolution, the Bible has become more accessible than ever, available in various translations, formats, and platforms. Whether through the physical pages of a book, an audio version on a commute, or a digital verse on a smartphone, the Word of God is omnipresent, inviting exploration and reflection. The Internet has become a powerful tool for scripture study, enabling swift, comprehensive searches and fostering global communities of believers keen to share insights, interpretations, and testimonies. We are living in a golden age of access to biblical wisdom, where the clarity and depth of understanding God's Word are realities facilitated by an abundance of resources, from detailed commentaries to enlightening online sermons. Prophecy number four, the scoffers in the last day. A scoffer in this context is one who mocks Christ, ridicules the things of God, and opposes the gospel. The role of scoffers in the last days will become more pronounced as the devil sponsors them as part of his end-time strategies to discourage believers from serving God. Scoffers are stirred up by the spirit of Antichrist against those who have chosen to serve God. I am not saying the Antichrist himself has arrived. The truth is, I don't know if he has or if he hasn't. But what I do know, and what I can see from just looking at the world, is that his spirit has. The spirit of the Antichrist is the rejection of the deity of Christ. 1 John 4, 3 states, and every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God, and this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. You see, there's coming a day, a day where there will stand a man, not just any man, but a figure, an embodiment, if you will, of the Antichrist. This isn't some fairy tale, folks. No, it's written. It tells us clear as day that though this man hasn't shown himself yet, his spirit, that spirit of deception and rebellion, is already here, working, prowling, and deceiving. But today we are going to look at the scoffers, those who mock, those who ridicule, those who laugh in the face of the Almighty and his children. Friends, we need to be vigilant, we need to be on guard, because these scoffers, with their sly words and their taunting, will try to shake you off the foundation of your faith. They'll try to pull you away from the straight and narrow path of righteousness and godliness that you've chosen, the path that leads to eternal life. How many of you have felt the sting of their mockery? How many of you have been questioned, doubted, or laughed at for your unwavering faith in Christ, for standing tall in your service to the Almighty? When they come at you, remember this. They are not operating on their own. No, sir. They are either knowingly or unknowingly being driven by that spirit of Antichrist. The Apostle Peter told us about these people. They walk after their own desires, their own pleasures. 2 Peter 3, 9-10 The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us ward, 
not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. In 2 Peter 3, 9-10, we find the heart of God revealed. When we wonder about His timing or question His return, this passage reminds us that God's timetable is not like ours. Understand this. The God of the universe, the one who set the heavens and the earth in motion, will keep His promise without delay, but on His divine timeline. He is long-suffering, folks. That means He's patient beyond our comprehension, desiring that as many souls as possible come to repentance. Let's take a step back and ponder. Many of you listening right now ask yourself, if Jesus had returned 20 years ago, where would you stand? Heaven or hell? What about 10 years ago or even just last year? The Lord's mercy and patience have allowed many of us more time to come to Him. His delay has been our salvation. Consider this. As I stand before you, across this world, souls are being saved. Someone, in a remote corner of the earth, is on their knees, giving their life to Christ. Right now, this very moment, and right in your hometown, hearts are turning towards the Savior. One by one, they're coming to the saving knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ.